Well, uh, once again, my thanks to you for uh, turning up uh, to uh, uh, this uh, lecture, to this lecture. Uh, and we spent uh, our time this winter reflecting uh, on the life of Abraham. And we've been through the main points in the narrative from this uh, uh, leaving uh, out of the Chaldees uh, and uh, through the covenant being formed between himself and God, uh, the birth of Isaac, and then the trial of Abraham's faith. And in all of these, the emphasis has been, I suppose, uh, on the narrative, on the history, the story of the patriarch. I want tonight to uh, take a different approach, perhaps, and to look at the theology which emerges uh, from that narrative, because Abraham uh, became a very important figure in the thinking of the Apostle Paul. Uh, and uh, some of Paul's uh, major thinking revolves uh, around uh, this particular figure from the Old Testament. And I want to see what uh, Paul makes of him, particularly in Galatians, uh, where Paul devotes uh, a lot of attention to Abraham's significance. And I want to begin with uh, a passage in Galatians 3 that may seem in some ways uh, rather obscure and marginal, uh, but which I think is very important. And it's in verse 17 uh, of Galatians uh, chapter 3. What I mean is this, the law introduced four and thirty years later does not set aside the covenant previously established by God and thus do away with the promise. The law does not set aside the covenant previously established. Now the whole concern of Paul uh, in this section of Galatians is with the relation uh, between uh, the law and the gospel uh, or indeed between Abraham and Moses. And uh, uh, for ourselves the emerging issue is uh, how the Old Testament relates to the New Testament and what's our working hypothesis uh, as to uh, the link between them. And Paul here makes a very, very simple point. He points out uh, that the law came 400 years uh, after the covenant with Abraham. And uh, he argues that because uh, God is an unchanging God, uh, God could not uh, so long afterwards dismantle the old arrangement and erect in its place uh, a different mechanism uh, for salvation. Uh, there's a kind of a priori argument. God wouldn't do that kind of thing. Uh, the covenant came first. It's God's covenant. And God doesn't change his mind. Uh, so whatever happens, uh, happened, Paul argues, uh, when uh, the law was given on Mount Sinai, it cannot mean God changing his mind. It can't mean a different way of salvation. It can't mean the abrogation uh, of the earlier uh, Abrahamic covenant. That is Paul's argument given by inspiration uh, of the Holy Spirit. So that's a simple fact, uh, the simple chronological fact from which Paul draws uh, this great inference. The law, the Mosaic law, uh, could not uh, undo the covenant that God made with Abraham. Now, from that, uh, a couple of inferences uh, follow. Uh, the first uh, inference is that the Mosaic law uh, does not do away with the Abrahamic covenant, or otherwise, that the Abrahamic covenant persists right through the Mosaic administration. The Abrahamic covenant persists right through the Mosaic a dispensation. Now I find even among uh, intelligent reformed Christians that there is great confusion on this matter and that many equate the Mosaic law uh, with the covenant of works and they seem to assume that under Moses 
people were saved by the law and justified by works of the law. So the Mosaic law to them was a covenant of works. Now, Paul is trying to convince us of the exact opposite, that uh, because of the timing, uh, the Abrahamic uh, covenant is the primary divine arrangement, and it persisted right through the Mosaic dispensation. In other words, under the Mosaic dispensation, people were not saved by works or justified by the law, but they were saved by faith and saved by grace because that was God's arrangement. That's what God brought in first, that uh, Abrahamic and gracious dispensation. Now, that's why we chose tonight to sing Psalm 51, because that's a psalm that comes right out of the Mosaic era. David lived under the law. Uh, there were uh, temple sacrifices, there was priesthood, there were all the food laws and all the other Mosaic regulations. And yet when David is convinced of his own sin and comes before God as a penitent, he does not appeal to the Mosaic law. He doesn't say to God, Lord, I have kept the law, I have uh, kept the food laws, I've kept all the rituals, all the sacrifices, I've uh, given all the offerings and so on. He doesn't say that. He says, after thy loving kindness, Lord, have mercy upon me, for thy compassions great blot out all my iniquity. And so here this man, under the dispensation of the law, goes straight to grace for the forgiveness of his sins, and for the consolations of God. In other words, he does exactly what Abram would have done. Uh, in Abram's day, there was no temple, uh, there were uh, no ritual food laws, there was no priesthood, there was simply God and his grace. And right through that Mosaic age, that Old Testament age, that was the principle uh, that that was in place. It was salvation by grace. It was salvation uh, by uh, the mercy of God. So we have this principle that under the Mosaic law, the Abrahamic covenant uh, was still in place. Now go back again to uh, a historical question. Uh, what came first? Israel's redemption from Egypt honest fields compliance with the law? And the obvious answer is, the redemption came first. They weren't redeemed because they had kept the law, but after they had been redeemed, they were given the law uh, as the rule of their lives. And that's why in the Old Testament order, uh, we have, as I keep on saying, the preface which says, I am the Lord your God, which brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. You shall have no other gods before me. And he doesn't say, provided you have no other gods before me, I will take you out of the house of bondage. But he says, I have taken you out. And because I have taken you out, you will keep the law. Uh, it is uh, an ethic of gratitude, a response to God's grace, is compliance with God's law. Now, in many ways, there is no more important or more fundamental principle of Christian life than this one. First redemption, then law. We cannot say, first keep the law and then redemption. Nor can we say redemption and therefore no need for the law. The divine order is God saves, and God saves in grace, and because God saves us in grace, we respond with gratitude, and we keep the law of God. So under the Old Testament, all of these great believers were saved by grace. They were all saved in terms uh, of the Abrahamic uh, dispensation. And uh, the law, as Paul says, uh, it comes in sideways, and the law is subordinate 
to the Abrahamic covenant. It is a temporary administration of the Abrahamic covenant, as we may see in more detail later on. But Moses and David and Isaiah and Jeremiah and all these people, they were saved uh, under the Abrahamic covenant. They were saved by the grace of God. They were saved uh, by faith. Now, let's uh, spell it out a little, uh, this uh, analogy, this comparison uh, between uh, uh, ourselves uh, and, uh, and uh, Abraham. Because not only is it true that under Moses, uh, the Abrahamic covenant is in place, but it's also true that in the Christian age, the Abrahamic covenant still stands. And just as uh, these Old Testament saints were saved in accordance with the Abrahamic covenant, so we are saved in terms of the same Abrahamic covenant. So there's this the second point here, that... Uh, the law which came 400 years afterwards cannot abrogate the Abrahamic covenant. But equally, the Christ who comes 2,400 years afterwards, he cannot abrogate that Abrahamic covenant either. There is nothing that happens in the, Old, in the New Testament that abrogates the Abrahamic covenant. Instead, uh, our New Testament is the fulfillment of the promises given under the Abrahamic covenant. And we, like uh, uh, Moses and David and like Abraham himself, we are saved under the same dispensation. So first of all, Mount Sinai doesn't abrogate the Abrahamic covenant. And secondly, the advent of Christ doesn't abrogate that covenant uh, either. Uh, Christ comes as the promised seed of Abraham. And we are Abraham's seed. We are, we are all, by faith, children of Abraham. And uh, we have to come to terms with that, I think, uh, with a, a deliberate consciousness. Uh, this is why uh, anti-Semitism is so impossible uh, for us uh, as Christians. Because Abraham uh, is, our, is our father. This is where we stand. We are Abraham's uh, spiritual children. We know that we're, from Romans 9 to 11 that uh, God in Christ doesn't set up a new church, de novo, a fresh start. But he grafts us into the existing Abrahamic church, into the ancient olive tree of Abraham. We are grafted in us uh, as unnatural branches into this great Abrahamic stock. So the point is, what God said to Abraham was meant to last forever. This was the, the, the definitive statement of God's way of salvation, the Abrahamic arrangement. This was how it was to be. And uh, whatever changes might come, or whatever greater light might be given to us, uh, the more perfect the revelation might become, yet the fundamentals of the arrangement would remain the same. Old Testament believers and New Testament believers are saved on exactly the same basis and on the same terms and conditions as was Abraham himself. That's why that this Abraham story is so important. Because right at the foundation of the story, God lays down uh, all the fundamental principles. So here we are, we are Abraham's children. But what does that mean for us? It means, first of all, that we are justified on the same ground as Abraham was justified. That is, we are justified by faith and justified by faith in God. And uh, this is a large part of Paul's argument uh, in both Romans and in Galatians. He asks, when was Abraham just a Paul is very much concerned with the, the chronological sequence of things in the life of Abraham. Uh, the Jews were saying that we had to be circumcised uh, to, uh, to be justified by for God. 
before God. Well, he said, well, when was Abraham justified? Uh, he says he received the sign of circumcision after his justification. He was not justified because he was circumcised, but he was circumcised because he was justified. Was he justified because he kept the law? Of course not, Paul says, there was no law. For another 400 years there was no law. So he wasn't justified by the law. So it wasn't uh, uh, the Jewishness symbolized by circumcision that justified him. Nor was this compliance with the Mosaic law that justified him, but he was justified by faith. Now, the Westminster Confession lays down as a categorical dogma of the Protestant Church that the justification of believers under the Old Testament was exactly the same as that of believers under the New Testament. It is a justification which is by grace alone, and one that's by faith alone, and one that's to the glory of God alone. And we, we're very conscious of the modernity of so much of our own life and culture, and there is constant talk, even in uh, circles such as ours, of uh, modernising the message and so on. Now, it, it seems, and I hope it's not simply the reactionary attitudes of a uh, of, uh, shall I say, an imminent geriatric that leads me to this, this perspective, but the message can't be modernised. Uh, there are things around it and about it that can be modernised, but the message itself cannot be, because it goes back to Jesus Christ, and it consists essentially in what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, Christ died for our sins and rose again the third day. How do you modernize that? You can put it in modern terms, in modern or in contemporary language, that is English as it's spoken today, but it's a message about events that happened 2,000 years ago. And uh, we must be very careful lest in the panic that sets in a church is empty, uh, we seek solutions in a modernizing, which in fact is itself a repudiation of our God-given message. But you see, it's not only going back to those years, it's going back beyond that to Abraham. Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him for righteousness. Now, you cannot say to, to, to us today, look, we cannot today, for goodness sake, keep on uh, preaching uh, truth that was truth for Abraham's day. That that message of 4,000 years ago, you can't be serious. You have to have uh, an up-to-date message. Well, look, you can put the message on CDs and on DVDs and in uh, all kinds of electronic formats. You can digitalize it uh, to your heart's content. But the message is still... Abraham believed God and it was counted to him for righteousness. There must be no panicking about that. This message is a God-given message and it was laid down uh, so long ago uh, when God made this covenant with Abraham. What does God require of us to our justification? God requires faith. He does not require that we keep or have kept the law or have un we have gone through various rituals of initiation, but he requires of us that we believe his own promise, which is, uh, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. And we believe that and we are justified, we are saved. So the same kind of justification. And again, there is this, that we receive the inheritance on the same terms and conditions as Abraham received it. And as Paul spells out here in verse 18, if the inheritance depends on the law, then it no longer depends on a promise. But God in his grace gave to Abraham uh, through a promise. Well, there, there is a great inheritance. 
on an EU mansion uh, in general terms again uh, any inheritance and you either have inherited or you hope to inherit something uh, and then you ask, the, you ask the person what did you pay for that inheritance what did that inheritance cost you what do you mean what did I pay for it what did it cost me Yes, I mean, how did you come to to inherit uh, all this stuff? What was what was the price of it? And I said, this is the snow price. It was in the will. It was a promise. I didn't earn it, uh, but it was promised, and uh, that God had made plain to Abraham what he would inherit. God had promised him something, uh, and God had. Uh, confirmed that promise with an oath and God had put it in his, in, his, in, his, in his testament, in his covenant. And I got it, he said, because God promised it to me. Uh, and that's all. It's simply God promised it to me. And uh, earlier on in this uh, same chapter, in uh, down in about in verse 14, uh, uh, that inheritance is defined more precisely uh, he redeemed us in order that the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles through Christ Jesus so that by faith we might receive the promise of the Spirit. Uh, what was the promised inheritance? What did God leave us in his will? What does the dying Christ bequeath to us from the cross of Calvary? Well, we know at one level that God promised Abraham that he would inherit the earth. And that he would have uh, a seed more numerous uh, than the grains of sand on the seashore. But above all, then, God promised him this, the promise of the Spirit. And how enormously important that is uh, in, in the current uh, theological climax with evangelicalism, where uh, the Spirit is, 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 is enormously important and rightly so. But people seem to think that uh, the spirit is an extra, uh, not uh, part of what you get at conversion, but something you get perhaps later, and which you get if you go through certain extra steps and certain pluses besides being a believer. And you ask, what have you done to earn the promise of the spirit? What have you done to earn spirit baptism or spirit filling or spirit sealing? Besides being converted, what, what did you actually do? What penances and what satisfactions and uh, what renunciations and what offerings did you uh, make in order to secure uh, this particular blessing? And you say, it, it was just a promise. Repent and be baptized and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And the whole inheritance uh, comes to us uh, on that basis. We are heirs of God, co-heirs with Christ. And uh, uh, we say to, to ourselves further that all the promises of God are yea and amen in Christ Jesus. Uh, in my uh, Highland back, though, people spoke often of getting a promise. I got a promise. And uh, I was never getting promises. It was very disconcerting. They were all getting them at me. But then I, I began to, to realize that all the promises were mine. Didn't need to get them in some special sense with some feelings clustered around them, some revel revelatory illumination, some flashes of lightning, uh, or my heart strangely warm. But look, they were all yea and amen in Christ Jesus. Shall he not with him also freely give us all things? And yes, we say, yes, all things but the Holy Spirit. Spirit baptism, no, all things. The, the promise of the Spirit through faith. That sheer graciousness of it all. You go back to the, maybe the core experience of Abraham. Why was Isaac born? What had he done to, to uh, receive such a great blessing and privilege? What had he paid for Isaac? What fee had he paid? What penances had he undergone to get Isaac? 
He said, it was just a promise, he said. I was dead, Abram, Moshe was dead, but God promised us Isaac and we got him. Just because God promised him, that was all. It was entirely gracious, gratuitous. We did nothing. We believed, that was all. We believed the promise. And that was all. God fulfilled his promise. And uh, for all of us tonight, we're in the same position that we, uh, we receive the inheritance, we receive all that God has promised us simply because God has promised these things to us. We have not taken uh, any additional steps. We've done nothing to earn any of it, uh, but God uh, has uh, given uh, these things to us. Or uh, uh, put it uh, another way, uh, a third point of comparison, uh, that through us, as through Abraham, blessing must come to the Gentiles. Uh, this was again part of God's promise uh, to, to Abraham, that in him all the Gentiles of the earth uh, would be blessed. And uh, this remains true, of course, today for the Christian church, and that's why the language of the Great Commission uh, is itself a uh, language which echoes God's promise to Abraham. Go, make disciples of all nations, in you shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. And of course, there is uh, an obligation put upon us by, uh, by that commission that we have uh, a certain debt which we owe uh, to the nations to disciple them and to baptize them in the name of the triune God. But yet there is something also so evangelical and so gracious in the terms of that commission because it is reminding us that we evangelize against the background of a promise. The first the promise, in you shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. Go make disciples of all the nations. And I think that's a tremendously important part uh, of our overall uh, missionary theology. God has promised us the Gentiles. God has promised us the nations. Do you go back to the New Testament church? It was entirely a Jewish church. And, uh, you know, there were uh, great debates which are uh, hinted at rather than recorded in detail in the early church about uh, the Gentile mission. Can you imagine? You know, we have our own debates about various issues, uh, like uh, uh, the free offer of the gospel and so on and so forth. And we think, well, these are very fundamental debates, debates about versions and so on. But they had this huge question. Is it right to take the gospel to the Gentiles. That was a huge issue. And it was right because God had made this promise that through Abraham and his seed, all the nations of the earth they would be blessed. And, and Paul, as a child of Abraham, uh, took that uh, with uh, uh, enormous uh, seriousness. And so should we. Because we are Abraham's children, and through us, the Gentiles, the whole non-Christian world, uh, must be blessed. But how encouraging it is that when we face what looks like an impossible task, we are working in the context and within the framework of this Abrahamic promises uh, uh, that his seed would inherit the earth. The two things are, are related. Uh, and you shall all the nations of the earth be blessed, your seed shall inherit the earth. We inherit the earth uh, by establishing the Christian faith uh, among all the nations uh, of the world. So we are justified on the same basis. Uh, we receive the inheritance on the same basis. Uh, we are called to engage in the same mission uh, as Abraham. Uh, all these things are true. And then there is this other fact which emerges uh, with regard to our freedom. Uh, we are free uh, as Abraham uh, was free. And this takes me down to chapter 4 and to the section Galatians 4 uh, from uh, verse uh, 21. And uh, this uh, memorable, although not easily accessible, uh, comparison uh, that uh, that we have uh, between uh, Sarah 
uh, and, uh, and Hagar, uh, the two covenants uh, symbolised by Hagar uh, and Sarah. And Paul is here standing at the, at the narrative and saying, uh, if, if we allegorise it, uh, what we have here, he said, uh, are two different covenants. Hagar represents the one covenant and Sarah represents the other covenant. Now the background here, of course, is that uh, Hagar uh, was a bondwoman. She was a slave. And her son, uh, Ishmael, uh, was therefore also born in bondage and born uh, into slavery. Whereas Sarah was a free woman uh, and her son Isaac, he was born as a free man. And so he says, there are two covenants then. Uh, and one of those covenants uh, is one that breeds slavery and the other covenant uh, breeds freedom and uh, uh, Paul also uh, links this to Mount Sinai uh, which is uh, in Arabia or in Araba and uh, the background that I suspect is that uh, that was uh, uh, both where Hagar came from and where Hagar went uh, with uh, uh, Ishmael uh, after uh, she was cast out and so he's taken these two facts about Hagar uh, she was a boss she was a slave and she came to the region around Mount Sinai and so therefore we have the two covenants represented uh, by the two mothers and also by the two children one is born a slave and one one is born free and uh, uh, we have uh, the whole emphasis yet falling upon the fact that uh, as uh, uh, children of the free woman of Sarah uh, and brothers of Isaac uh, we too uh, are we are free we're not in bondage uh, but we are free now this again uh, raises a, a whole uh, raft of uh, interesting and in some ways uh, rather complex issues especially we focus on, on, on the words uh, that uh, reminded us that he was to cast out the bondwoman with her son. And the issue then becomes, uh, does that mean that, uh, that the law is to be cast out? And if so, uh, in what sense is the law uh, to be cast out? Now, if you'll bear with me, one of the problems here is that the word law itself uh, carries uh, various senses. Uh, one uh, of those senses is what we call the moral law, which is summarised uh, in the Ten Commandments. But in Paul, most often the law means the Mosaic law, and not so much the Decalogue as the adjuncts, uh, the, 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 the laws with regard to worship and sacrifice and ritual in the temple, uh, and also the political, political laws of Israel and the food laws and such things uh, that is what Paul was uh, most often uh, meaning by his use of the word law. Now what position can we uh, work uh, towards here uh, in the light of the Hagar and Sarah uh, analogy? It's clear first of all that as far as uh, Paul and indeed the Lord himself is concerned the Mosaic law is no longer binding on the Christian church that is uh, the, that all sacrificial uh, apparatus that we have around the temple uh, and the food laws these things have all uh, been abolished and they have no longer uh, any part to play in the life of Christians. Now Jesus himself, uh, we know, made all foods clean at a stroke. He said there is no food clean, there is no food unclean. Now in the days of, of Abraham, there were no food laws. As John Calvin says, uh, we've no reason to believe that Abraham didn't eat pork. Uh, it wasn't forbidden. Uh, before uh, the law of Moses. Uh, so uh, we, we can say with some confidence that uh, the whole burden 
uh, of the, the Mosaic law, uh, that burden uh, has been uh, lifted, uh, not to mention, of course, all the rabbinical additions uh, to that law. And that was the bondage. Uh, this was the Hagar element of it. Uh, that uh, the, the law, all these uh, rituals and these food laws and so on, they bred enslavement because people thought they to fulfill these laws in order to earn uh, their own salvation. Works for them would have meant compliance uh, with those stipulations of, of the Mosaic law. So we can safely say uh, that uh, these mosaic elements brought in after Abraham uh, have been uh, superseded uh, by the teaching of Jesus uh, and they've been repealed uh, by the New Testament and are no longer binding. Does that mean then that we are no longer in any sense at all uh, under the law? What's been abrogated and what remains in place? Now, as I said, the distinctive Mosaic laws are abrogated. But something else too has been abrogated or, or repealed, and that is the idea that we are to earn our salvation by do and live. Now, perhaps I should say not abrogated, but that was never God's arrangement. Since man fell, nobody has ever been saved, nobody has ever been redeemed by do and live. Now it's important to bear in mind that under the Old Testament, people were not saved by do and live. To remember that Moses did not preach do and live, but Moses preached live and do. You've been redeemed. You shall have no gods before me. So there is no do and live principle. So, first of all, all those uh, mosaic distinctives about rituals and sacrifices and food laws, these have been abrogated. And secondly, the do and live principle lives only in the human conscience and in the legalism of the human heart. There's so much in us that wishes that it were still the way to God because then we could be saved with such pride and with such high self-esteem. We've done and so we live. And our our human religiosity clings so tenaciously to the whole idea of self-salvation. Do and live. And you think it must somehow be up to me. It must be up to me in the sense that I must comply with the laws, the principles of God, or I must uh, have uh, uh, the proper kind of religious experience, the proper kind of conversion, I must have a good testimony. It must somehow be down to me. But the Gospel is saying, you who have not done, who have not kept the law, who have not lived the Decalogue, you who haven't got a great testimony that you could tell and you'd fill a great, uh, you'd fill the, fill the Wembley Arena with your testimony. You couldn't do that. You don't have a testimony worth telling you for a very ordinary conversion. But still you're saved. You're forgiven. You're the child of God. Even though there, there's nothing about ourselves that we would boast of. And that's another very important Pauline principle. Where is boasting? It's a very interesting challenge, that. What are you proud of at the spiritual level? Proud of my church connection. I'm proud of my theological knowledge. I'm proud of my conviction of sin, of my love for fellow believers. I'm proud of my missionary zeal. I'm proud 
on my prayer life, how long I pray, how well I pray. I'm proud of my conversion experience. Tremendous story I've got to tell. Of course you're not. Paul would be horrified to imagine that you were boasting in any of these things. And he would say, God forbid that I should glory save in the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. So the whole do and live thing, not relevant, not in place. It was abolished by God in his earliest words with Abraham. It was, was very plain that that wasn't the way. So what then is the law doing? As, as, as Paul asks, uh, wherefore then uh, serve the law? What is the purpose of the law uh, if, if it isn't? Uh, you see that in, in Galatians 3 verse 19. What then was the purpose of the law? This law which was given 430 years afterwards. Why? Having done so well without the Mosaic law for 400 plus years, why then the law? What is the law doing? Now, the reformers gave a great deal of thought to this question, and uh, you must forgive me if I have to admit that uh, uh, little of what I say is original. There's a very famous principle that what is uh, original is, uh, uh, the, the, what's true is not original, what's original is not true, but we'll forget that for the moment. But uh, going back to Calvin and Luther, uh, Three points emerged from their reflections on the place of the law because uh, just as for, for Paul and uh, the Galatians, so for the Reformers and the Roman Catholic Church, the law was a big issue because fundamentally, do and live in uh, its various guises it was the whole point at issue. Now they came up uh, with the idea uh, of the threefold use of the law, the law had, had three functions. There was, first of all, what they called the political use of the law. The law had a political or a civil use. That is, the law as applied to human society. And there is no doubt that that was a large part of the function of the Mosaic law, because remember, Israel was a, a nation state as well as a church. It was a theocracy in which church and state were one. But there was a civil order and there was a criminal justice system and there were civil codes. And the law regulated that criminal justice system uh, and uh, such matters as uh, uh, debt uh, and slander and so on were all regulated uh, by the Mosaic law. Now, uh, that civil or political law reflected the ten principles of the Decalogue. Uh, in particular, uh, the political law would safeguard the great principles uh, of uh, the sanctity uh, of life and the sanctity of uh, uh, marriage and the sanctity of uh, property uh, and the sanctity of truth and the sanctity of a neighbor's reputation. All these fundamental sanctities they were set forth in the Ten Commandments, Sixth, Seventh, Eighth, Ninth Commandment, uh, safeguarded all these sanctities. And uh, to varying degrees, uh, all the world's uh, justice systems encapsulate those uh, great sanctities. Now, we might add to them, of course, other provisions too, that uh, the civil law of Israel also safeguarded the Sabbath, uh, and the civil law of Israel uh, also protected uh, the name of God, and it protected also uh, the uh, nation from idolatry, because this was a, a nation which was itself committed uh, to the worship of God. So the civil law uh, itself safeguarded the religion. But the fundamental thing is the law had this political uh, function. Now in Romans 13, Paul indicates that the law still has a political use. And it's one of the anomalies of the world we're in today. 
a world that is so liberal and so promiscuous that probably there have been more acts of parliament criminalising more forms of human behaviour in the last 10 years than at any previous point in British history. That's why tonight there are 17,000 more people in British jails than there were 10 years ago. It's a strange thing. Liberal society. Well, the, our jails crammed as never before because we're criminalising this, that and the other. Now, the principle I would want to, to work towards is the criminal justice system, to limit ourselves to that, must criminalise what God condemns, what God criminalises. And the magistrate must punish what God says he may and must punish. Now, I don't want to go down. Uh, I had a feedback from students this week and they want to attention the fact that the professor is rather inclined to ride his, ride his hobby horses. Uh, so forgive me for I had one for a moment, but there's a very, very interesting principle in uh, the, the whole theology of law is fascinating, but one grave risk we run today is that our jails uh, are uh, 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 being asked to accommodate more and more people, not because of what they have done, but because of what they might do. In other words, they're a danger to society. And you say, well, what has he done? Well, two strikes and you're out. He offended, and he offended, and somewhere a bureaucrat has stamped the form and put a tick and said, may offend again, therefore he is in prison because of what he might do. It's a terrific change in the whole criminal justice system. And what I'm saying is that it's a complete fallacy to imagine that if you depart from the absolute standards of God, you will get a more tolerant and genial and kindly and humane society. We have the paradox uh, of uh, uh, a world uh, which uh, is liberal, which is permissive, which has legalised, as you would think, that your perception probably is that they've legalised so many things, but what they've done is the exact opposite. They've criminalised more things than ever before. And that's why the jails are fuller than ever before. And that's why it's so important that the uh, criminal justice system is regulated by the law of God and that it, co it, it condemns what God condemns and punishes what God says should be, punishes, should be punished and punishes with punishments appropriate to God's own attitude to human beings. It is, a, it is a terrible, futile, hopeless task to get any politician in Britain to take aboard the problem of prison reform because there are no votes in it, because they know that you want to be tough on crime. And that's why we are collectively guilty uh, of imposing uh, on thousands of unfortunates uh, conditions which are degrading in the extreme and, and, and which uh, come under the same principle as led the Old Testament to limit the lash to 39 lashes. Because otherwise the, the brother becomes contemptuous in your eyes. And our prisons uh, are such as to reduce human beings to levels uh, of appalling uh, degradation. So what will happen if you abandon God's standards is not to get a more humane society. You will get one uh, in which uh, you may end up in prison not because of what you've done but because of what you might do and uh, not because of... Yeah, the old days, motive was everything. What is the motive for a crime? Oh, well, there was no motive, but he fell asleep at the wheel. And so that for eight years in prison. That's what happens if we're going to abandon the absolute uh, divine norms. Well, I'll leave the hobby horse. The second thing uh, that the reformer said about the law was that uh, it had what they called its uh, pedagogical use. In other words... The law led you to Christ. Now, 
there are interesting issues about that precise form of words, the laws or schoolmaster, not so much to lead us to Christ, but until Christ comes, until Christ came, and then the law, in the sense that Paul means, was abrogated, the Mosaic law no longer applied. But what Luther in particular uh, said was this, uh, the function of the law is so to convince us of our guilt as to drive us to Christ. And uh, that's uh, here too in verse 19. It was added because uh, of transgressions. And we know the whole background by the laws, the knowledge of sin. Well, the law did a whole lot of things in that connection. Uh, on one level, for example, the Mosaic law made things wrong that weren't intrinsically wrong. What I mean by that is, for example, that they come back again to the kosher laws, the food laws. The, the, there was no reason why Abram shouldn't eat pork, so Abram probably did, but God forbade it. And, and things became sinful in Israel that weren't inherently sinful, the same way as in, in school, for example, there are certain positive laws that say you can use this gate but not use that gate because uh, that has a kind uh, of uh, educative function. They will learn respect for authority or something. So the law, as Paul says in Romans, multiplied transgressions. And then the law also, or we've been down this one I think before, the law itself became, became a temptation. Paul himself tells us, when I read that, that law, that commandment that said, thou shalt not covet, I wanted to covet like mad. You know, because it's forbidden. And you're mesmerized by it. You, you want to pull the communication cord on the train because the notice says, that if you do so, you'll be prosecuted, and it becomes a temptation. You want to do it, and we know with youngsters today and the whole drug problem, uh, that uh, simply because uh, a thing is forbidden, uh, it becomes uh, therefore attractive. And we know the story of Augustine and the, pa and the pears. Augustine tells near his own home there was an orchard full of pears, and he said, we, we hated pears. But... Uh, they were forbidden, and so we all stole them and wanted them because they were forbidden. So he's saying this in the same way here. Uh, the fact of a thing being forbidden itself makes it attractive. And above all, the law gave you a standard by which to measure yourself, a benchmark, that said, you're falling short, you're a sinner. In other words... If you listen only to your own conscience or to public opinion, you may very well decide that you're not such a bad person after all. I'm as good as anybody else. But when you come up against the law of God that says in its, in its inwardness, you shall not covet, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself and love the Lord your God with all your heart. When you face that, then you realize that you do need Christ. By the law, it's the knowledge of sin. I may be as good as anybody else. My conscience may be at peace with me. But in, I know when I look at God's law, I know then that I'm a sinner. So that was the second uh, function of the law, this pedagogical function, uh, to convince us of our own need and to drive us uh, to the Lord Jesus Christ. But then there was the other, the third use of the law, and on this, uh, Luther and Calvin uh, rather divided because uh, Luther did not really allow the law uh, much of a place in the Christian life, whereas uh, Calvin insisted that the law was the rule of life for a Christian. He is back again to the old principle live and do. You have been redeemed, therefore you will love the Lord your God with all your heart and your neighbour as yourself. And it was very important for Calvin that 
the law should be the regulator of our uh, daily conduct. Uh, not that we would do the law in order to obtain eternal life, but because we had eternal life, we both owed it to God to live that way, and we had the life by which we could live that way. And that's why Calvin and Institutes uh, devote so many pages to expounding the Ten Commandments um, because that was what the Christian life was. A Christian lifestyle was one that lived the Ten Commandments. How you say to me, yes, but Jesus abolished these commandments of the Old Testament is now superseded. Well, let's go to the New Testament and to the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 5, and that amazing passage where the Lord says to us, and unless you righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of God. Those Pharisees, they were so strict. And God has told us that God doesn't require that kind of strictness. We don't need to be as hard on ourselves as the Pharisees were on their contemporaries because we're under the reign of grace and therefore we uh, we don't have the same pressure. Well, let's forget the Pharisees. Except Jesus' word that your righteousness must exceed that of the scribes and the Pharisees. Uh, how can that be? And the answer is, is given by the Lord himself. That the rule of life for us Christians is the Ten Commandments as expounded by Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount. He is not there abrogating the Ten Commandments. He is expounding them, showing us the real meaning of these ten words. Now, the problem is that you have terrific defense mechanisms. And the moment that I say this, all our mechanisms are thinking about, oh, what about grace and justification by faith alone, etc., etc. And that's our gospel and... Uh, of course, we aren't uh, uh, expected to 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 live the sermon, and uh, I gave an essay on this recently, and uh, everybody came up with the answer that uh, what the Lord meant by that uh, righteousness that exceeded that of the scribes and Pharisees was the imputed righteousness of Christ. That was the exceeding special righteousness. Of course it is a superb righteousness that of Jesus, but he is not speaking in Matthew 5 of something imputed to us. He is speaking to us of a personal righteousness which exceeds that of the Pharisees and which replicates that of the Sermon on the Mount. You could tell these Jews because they kept the Ten Commandments. You can tell the Christian because they keep the Sermon on the Mount. And our belief, my belief, in justification by faith alone must never become an excuse for not living out the law of God as expounded by the Sermon on the Mount. Christ has borne his own body in his flesh. The condemnation due to sin, says Paul in Romans 8, so that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. Three uses of the law the political use whereby the law regulates our civil and criminal codes of justice. The pedagogical use whereby 
the law gives us the bad conscience that sets us looking for a saviour and the law as a rule of life which means that we Christians are distinguished by the fact that we turn the other cheek that we go the extra mile and that we love not only our friends and neighbours but we love our enemies that is the rigorous ethic that Jesus lays down and you say to me well what has that to do with Abraham well God's covenant with Abraham included this that Abraham would teach his children the right way he would teach them to do righteousness and justice he was justified by faith alone and he did righteousness and justice there has to be a Christian difference it's not a difference that means that we attend more meetings or pray longer or read devotional books or may be sustained by all those practices it is fundamentally a difference in lifestyle which means that we live the law we do righteousness and justice we live out the sermon on the mount and that would mean in essence that although we know few details of Abraham's personal life we are confident that he as well as the seed Jesus Christ lived out the lifestyle laid down for us in Matthew 5 to 7 and so just to uh, sum it up as we take leave of it the fundamental nature of the gospel laid down for us in the story of Abraham 400 years before the law came he believed God's promise and God justified him Moses and all his followers were saved on the same basis and so are we the law came in as a part of the administration of grace to lead us to Christ and to guide us as to how we should live well I shall leave it there in the meantime if there are points you want to raise uh, I'll do my best to uh, cope with them